have the governor here to speak with us today. Um, there are several initiatives um, around which um, the business community is very excited, initiatives around workforce development and also some industrial land development about which I believe he's going to cover. Um, but before we do that, I have the privilege of um, introducing um, Jim Pyro, who is the CEO of PGE, and PGE is our keynote speaker sponsor, so we thank them very much for that. Um, Jim is the chief executive officer and um, president of, Gen of PGE and has 36 years of experience uh, in the utility business. He's also actively engaged in Oregon's economic revitalization, which we all know is just so important, not only through his work at PGE, but also through his service as the co-chair of the Greater Portland Inc. and as a board member of the Oregon Business Council and as the co-chair of Governor Kitzhopper's 10-year um, budget reform committee. So with that, I welcome um, Jim to the podium. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. What a great day. I know you'd love, a lot of you would like to be out in the golf course. looks pretty nice out there, but uh, we're, we'll be focused here for a while. Uh, I knew I liked Keith a lot, but now that I know he's a beaver, I even like him more. I'm a beaver also. So, you know, how often can we say, you know, we're undefeated and the Ducks are undefeated? So, you know, it's nice to get excited about football, but, but, but frankly, we have a great university system. And University of Oregon, Oregon State, Portland State, the community college system and our private colleges create a huge economic force for us. And I'm involved a lot with Oregon State and the amount of research they do is just fantastic and it really helps us in growing the economics of our region. Uh, so good morning, it's great to be here again. I was here last year, I was telling Allison, last year it was Ted Wheeler, this year the governor. God, who's next year, Allison? <laughs> she says, I wanna just get through this year, so let's get through this, this one. Uh, so I have the honor of introducing Gen Governor John Kitzhopper, who has been steadfastly focused on revitalizing Oregon's economy. It's an issue most of us have focused on, and while we're, ma while we're making progress over the last couple of years with unemployment down from its double digits highs and Oregon's job growth leading the nation, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, even before the recession, beginning in the 1990s, the Portland metro area saw a decline in per capita income to below the national average. In fact, Portland metro areas rank 73rd out of 374 metro areas uh, in terms of per capita income. Uh, and Oregon itself is about 10% below the national average. PG supports Oregon's economic future by working to promote long-term economic development and job creation in our region, which can benefit both local businesses, schools, and government. We collaborate with government, civic, and business groups like the Gresham Chamber of Commerce to help existing companies thrive and attract new businesses to the region. PG is also an active member of Greater Portland Inc., which is the public-private partnership focused on retaining and growing existing businesses and attracting new businesses. And I really want to commend Mayor uh, Shane Bemis for his participation and involvement with Greater Portland Inc. Uh, we, he really helped this uh, come to reality. We're also very fortunate to have Sean Robbins as our president of Greater Portland, Inc. Uh, his, Sean's vision uh, for this organization and accountability to deliver real, tangible economic growth is really uh, spectacular. He's really doing a great job. Uh, but if we're going to truly revitalize our state's economy and create a more prosperous future, a prosperous future, we also have to deal with the financial structural problems that exist in Oregon that impact both the state and local communities like Gresham. As co-chair of Governor Kitzhopper's 10-year budget reform committee, our committee is working to change the way the state budgets its resource. It's clear that we need to prioritize how we spend limited public dollars to achieve the outcomes that are important. The purpose of this effort is to get better outcomes for the dollars spent and drive innovation in how agencies work together, together to deliver the services our community expects, whether they're in the area of healthcare, education, or public safety. We're also trying to move from a two-year uh, budget process to a 10-year uh, budget view so that we can make the best long-term decisions for our state versus being trapped in the two-year budget window. I want to thank the governor for his leadership effort in this area, and special thanks uh, to Michael Jordan, the state's chief operating officer, for really making this new way of budgeting a reality. Once the governor presents his budget later this year for the biennium, uh, we'll need to work closely with the legislative branch to adopt this new way of allocating state resources to achieve the best outcomes. We also need to do more to put the state, our local communities, and the people who live here on more solid economic ground. If we're going to continue to create jobs and put more Oregonians back to work, 
We need to create a positive business environment that allow existing businesses to grow and attract new businesses and their employees. We need to have the land and infrastructure available that businesses rely on, as well as an educated workforce, so important to a globally competitive environment. These essential building blocks that the public and private sector provides help attract and retain our businesses. PGE is doing its part in ensuring that we have the electrical infrastructure in place to meet the needs of these future customers, as well as deliver the reliability they need and expect in the future. State and local communities need to st a stable and adequate public revenue system to support critical public services like police, fire protection, and education. We all know how much our state and cities are being squeezed financially. Everyone is being asked to do more with less. Gresham, with its proxi proximity to Portland Airport and the Port of Portland, good land supply, and a strong grid system, is poised to attract economic growth. However, Gresham is also experience, experiencing difficulty maintaining vital basic services even more acutely than many cities due to the low property tax rate resulting from Measure 50. While Mayor Bemis is actively working to address the local shortfall, uh, we also need to take a more comprehensive approach across the, country, across the state. We're all in this together, and we need to make the difficult decisions that will enable us to grow the economy both in Gresham and throughout the state. Governor Kitzhopper is already spearheading this effort. He is working extremely hard to transform our education, health care, and budget systems to deliver the outcomes our communities desire, given the limited resources we have. He also has spent a lot of time, in his own personal time, on job retention and job growth that will result in more revenue to, to improve our state's economy. So with that, let's, uh, please join me in welcoming Governor John Kitzhopper. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Seems we've got a slippery slope here, just a second. There we go. Thank you very much, Jim. And Jim has done uh, an incredible amount of work and time and energy on this 10 year budget plan, which is truly going where no one has gone before. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting budget, probably a unique budget, and to hope that you will all work with us to make sure that we learn from the mistakes and continue to move towards a more you know, vital, uh, foresighted uh, way to budget in the state. Um, I want to just uh, thank you for having me out here today, and I want to talk about something that I think is on all of our minds, uh, certainly has been a focus of m uh, my administration for the last 18 months, and that is figuring out how to put Oregonians uh, back to work in, in every community across the state. As you know, the recession hit Oregon particularly hard. It hit our rural counties even harder. Uh, we faced uh, an enormous fiscal crisis, as bad probably as any in the nation. But as we've seen time and time again, uh, in the face of adversity, Oregonians simply don't give up. Um, the resilience of our citizens uh, over the past uh, 18 months has been very, very refreshing uh, to me. And as we pull out of this, this recession, the fact that we are still together after 18 months, unlike places like Wisconsin, is profoundly important and very, very uh, optimistic. Um, we often hear the phrase economic recovery. Uh, I don't think economic recovery is going to do it for Oregon and allow us to be competitive in the 21st century. Economic recovery suggests going back to the way we've been doing things before. I don't think we need economic recovery as much as we need economic reinvention. Because I think it's through economic reinvention that we can in, in, ensure an enduring prosperity for all our citizens. I think it's through economic reinvention that we can meet some of our aspirational goals, creating 25,000 jobs a year, uh, creating a workforce that's capable of uh, the economy of the 21st century, and as Jim mentioned, driving our per capita income back up above the national average uh, in every corner of our state. And the fact is that this economic reinvention is already growing in many, many parts uh, of Oregon. Uh, believe it or not, the unemployment rate is lower in Boardman and Hood River uh, and in Corvallis than it is in the Portland metropolitan area. And the reason is that there are these islands of innovation in both urban and rural communities that are beginning to tap into Oregon's natural assets and our market advantages in very new uh, and creative ways. 
whether that's the biomass entrepreneurs at the Port of Morro who are creating jobs that pay 150% of the local wage rate, or the new homegrown cutting edge uh, industries and companies that are emerging from the Oregon Nanoscience and Microtechnology Institute in Corvallis, this, this economy of innovation is really taking root in the state. And I think it's one of our best opportunities and best hopes for the future uh, because it's locally driven and it's built upon some of our natural strengths, a solid base in, in agriculture, in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and forestry, uh, promising research and development and commercialization opportunities, and of course our strategic location uh, on the uh, Pacific Rim with access to these burgeoning uh, Asian markets. Now for that kind of innovative economy to thrive, it's got to be built on a very, very solid base. Uh, since I took office in January of 2010, We've managed to close or erase a $3.5 billion uh, budget deficit and balance our budget with uh, civility and, uh, and integrity, uh, unlike the kind of rancor that we've seen uh, in many states uh, across the nation. We've increased access to capital, we've streamlined uh, regulations, and we've taken steps to make state government smaller and more nimble. We've invested in local infrastructure. We've developed new strategies to promote uh, uh, economic equity for small and emerging businesses throughout the state of Oregon. And we've created these regional solution centers across the state that I'll touch on in just a moment. So from those efforts, here's what we've seen. We're at one of the lowest uh, um, uh, unemployment rates that we've had in uh, three years. Uh, la over the last 18 months, we've created uh, 25,000 jobs, uh, about 14,000 of those jobs uh, in the last four months alone. We had the second fastest growing state economy in the country uh, in 2011, which prompted Forbes magazine to rate Oregon as one of the top 10 places to do business. We're ranked number one for manufacturing. Uh, we've got the uh, second lowest tax rate on new investments uh, in the nation. Now, all that's, I think, very good and hopeful and promising news, but it uh, in no way suggests that we don't have a lot more to do or that the gains that we've made are being equitably distributed. We still have many counties in our state, particularly in the east and southwest, that have uh, double-digit uh, unemployment, uh, and we haven't created enough family wage jobs within those 25,000 uh, jobs that we have uh, created, which means that we've got to redouble our efforts uh, in, in this direction if we want to truly create a more robust economic future for, for all, of our, all of our citizens. So here are a few things that I think we need to, need to continue to focus on. First, and perhaps most importantly for this particular uh, area, we've got to make sure that we actually have space for these new innovative uh, companies and businesses we're trying to attract and grow. Towards that end, uh, an interesting cast of characters, including uh, a Business Oregon, Metro, the Portland Business Alliance, the Oregon chapter of the Commercial Real Estate Development Association, Port of Portland, and my Portland Regional Solutions team, uh, completed a comprehensive examination of the region's large industrial land sites. I think this process was a very good example of partnership uh, between the public and private sector trying to address uh, regional economic development challenges. <clears throat> and this effort had a number of goals. The first one was to <clears throat> examine the supply sorry, <clears throat> of market-ready sites that exist within the existing, thank you very much. The f first uh, uh, a goal was to try to examine the existing uh, market-ready sites that actually exist within the Portland urban growth boundary. Second, to develop or to determine the cost and benefits of, of uh, developing each of these sites. And then finally, beginning a state and regional dialogue on the tools and policies that would be necessary to maintain a market-ready inventory of large industrial sites for traded sector uh, investment. So basically, what, what land do we have out there that's already zoned appropriately to support a state and regional economic development objectives? And the, the, the report, which you might want to take a look at, concludes that the region, in fact, lacks uh, an inventory of market-ready uh, supply of industrial land to attract the kind of catalytic employers that we're going to need to drive uh, uh, family wage jobs and compete effectively in the uh, global economy. Out of the 56 sites that we looked at in this area, just a handful uh, were actually market-ready, and of those, only one was over 100 acres, which is the LST site uh, here in, in Gresham. Other potential sites in the region are clearly going to require additional investments and actions to make them uh, ready for development, and probably the biggest challenge is public infrastructure, uh, water, uh, sewer, storm, stormwater, transportation, things of that nature. But it's clear that addressing those infrastructure barriers can remove the market viability gap in many of these sites and then open them up for, uh, for development. 
we also know that this work is relevant beyond just the Portland metropolitan area. I think communities across the state are facing exactly the same thing, and they may actually be more challenging uh, in rural parts of the state that have less access to capital and have a greater set of hurdles to go over in order to attract businesses to that area. But it's clear that if we can overcome those challenges, the report makes it very, very clear that we can create the vital family wage jobs we need uh, while uh, uh, bringing important economic benefits to both local government uh, and, and to the state government. Further, I think that industrial site readiness is not just an economic development tool, it's also very, very important for our land use system. Because if we focus on site readiness, it helps increase the efficiency of the land use system by focusing efforts and resources towards sites that are already within the, uh, the urban growth boundary. So like so much of our work, the success of this effort is going to require engaging partners at both the in both the public sector and the private sector, and it's also going to require some patience especially for those sites that require more in-depth uh, regulatory review, for example, brownfield site cleanup or annexation or zoning uh, issues. But I think the effort will be well worth it if at the end of the day we can uh, address the shortage in market-ready industrial sites in this region and across the state, because clearly a competitive uh, inventory of large market-ready industrial sites is the key to attracting uh, traded sector uh, investment, which is what's going to get our, our job base uh, back up to where it needs to be. Uh, I think that the way to tackle this, and it's certainly not a short-term or, or, or simple approach, is that we've all, we all knew we need to em embrace and commit ourselves to this in initiative and leverage where we can see the results. But at the end of the day, the work uh, and the ownership of this process has got to be driven by the local stakeholders who need to step up and set priorities and lead implementation. And when it becomes clear that the will uh, and the, uh, the focus is there, uh, then we will bring in the appropriate state agencies and try to coordinate and integrate them through our regional solutions team. So this is an area that's of, of, of extreme importance, but I think we're making some real progress on identifying the problem and now has a, have a pathway to begin to address that issue. Second, uh, as Jim mentioned, we need to uh, continue to support a very strong and uh, uh, educated workforce. The Oregon Workforce Investment Board has been working diligently on a plan that helps uh, uh, get people back to work while preparing citizens not just for jobs of today, but also for the anticipated careers of tomorrow. It's called the Oregon at Work Plan. It was uh, released last summer, and it improves the way the state provides workforce services uh, to better meet the needs of citizens and businesses alike. It focuses essentially on enhancing public-private partnerships to better identify the needs uh, that industry has for workers, and high skilled workers now. Uh, it creates certified work-ready communities, and it invests to integrate a workforce system to respond to the needs of today's industries while preparing for possible changes in the economy to five, ten years down the road. I think if we work together, it's very clear that we can develop a, 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 a state where employers know they can grow and locate here and, and find the skilled workers that they actually need, and where Oregon graduates and job seekers uh, can be ready to contribute to our economy and to our society, and also have the anticipation that their wages are going to be on a scale uh, that moves up. Um, I think this is not only true for our large and influential businesses that call Oregon a home, but I think it's true for businesses throughout, throughout the state. I would remind you that the average uh, Business in Oregon has about 15 employees. Uh, these are the companies that you work with uh, every day. They form up actually the bulk of our economy. The 85,000 plus businesses in Oregon that uh, employ fewer than 500 people uh, are really the group that's going to lead us out of this recession. Uh, and uh, they need to make sure that they have the workers that they need when it comes time for them to expand. The same idea motivates much of the work we're doing in the educational area. Uh, for the first time in Oregon's history, we're aligning funding and governance across the entire continuum of education from early childhood to post-secondary education and training. <clears throat> we're investing through this new 10-year budget and the Oregon Education Investment Board in better learning outcomes for students and adult learners of all ages. We are uh, focusing on early childhood investments. Uh, making sure that kids are ready to learn when they get to school and reading at level in the third grade because we recognize that the early educational success of children is probably the most effective job training program uh, we could possibly uh, put into place. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's clear that our, our, our high quality of life in Oregon and our long-term prosperity uh, require a diverse economy that actually produces family wage jobs or pathways to those kinds of jobs. Uh, an environment where businesses can grow and innovate, and a skilled workforce is absolutely essential to making both of those things both of those things happen. And we're making, I think, very significant progress on that front. 
Third, I think we have to be very creative in how we try to solve some of these problems to support uh, uh, growing uh, businesses and also to create an environment that encourages entrepreneurism and that cr encourages innovation. I mentioned one of these already, that's the Regional Solutions Program. We've got regional solution centers around the state embedded in universities and community colleges where st state uh, agency staff are co-located. We have local uh, conveners, and the idea is to leverage uh, uh, federal, state, and local resources, public, private, and phil philanthropic resources on targeted local economic uh, or, and community uh, uh, priorities. Uh, we were involved in the regional solutions. We're involved in actually siting the uh, energy wave buoy down in Reedsport. They're now working on a project to uh, pull additional water out of the Columbia during high seasons to expand irrigated agriculture, and I think they're, they're, they're a new and interesting tool to actually leverage resources in this time of, of fiscal shortfall when we can't really afford single purpose investments, that the investments we make really need to leverage other resources and solve a, a multiple problems. The other one is the State Trade Enhancement Program, which gives small businesses access to a training and capacity building and helps them go to trade shows and trade missions so that they can increase their export opportunities. We've got about 90 small businesses involved in this program right now, and since they're actually able to increase the value of their exports, they're contributing to this larger state goal, which is to double the value of Oregon exported products and services uh, by the end of the decade. We just received uh, a, a, a competitive grant from the federal government of another $500,000 for the STEP program, which means that we can uh, add more small businesses as well as provide scholarships for uh, um, uh, 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 expert training for, through the Small Business uh, Development Center at PCC, uh, grants uh, for industry-led missions, and particularly um, export counseling training for economic uh, developers through the Oregon Economic Development Association and the Brookings Metropolitan uh, Export Initiative. Uh, next week, uh, just about 10 days from now, uh, I'll be participating in a trade mission to China and, and Japan. Uh, that will include government officials, representatives of Oregon's established businesses, uh, but also uh, a wide variety of new startups that are looking to actually expand their export opportunities, and the heads of uh, research and commercialization centers like Onami and Best that are trying to uh, promote their products and services ab abroad. In addition, as a result of uh, uh, some pretty exciting collaboration between local entrepreneurs and, and investors and Chinese institutions, this trade mission will have a particular focus on exporting Oregon's growing expertise in green building and, 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 uh, and green building uh, design. In fact, we're signing an MOU in Shanghai to be the agent to do the build out on, 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 on China's eco communities that they're building around the state and they want to use Oregon's expertise in this area, which could be a real big boon to us as well as the supply chains that, that are associated uh, with that. I just want to say that this focus on innovation that I'm referring to is not just about specific programs and priorities. The idea is to actually change our culture. So a culture of innovation that focuses on the infrastructure that we need to meet our goals, uh, a mindset that recognizes that we need to reduce barriers while ac accelerating partnerships, uh, and a framework that allows state and local governments to partner with the private sector and with the educational sector. These are the kinds of things that Oregon's going to need to thrive uh, in the economy of the 21st century. By infrastructure, I mean not just traditional infrastructure, core infrastructure like the CRC or traditional roads and, 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 uh, and bridges, but what I would call innovation infrastructure, which would be energy efficient buildings or transmission lines or water projects or the smart grid. And what's clear is that the traditional sources of funding for infrastructure, particularly federal sources, are drying up. Be, if you watch the mindless uh, uh, effort to just extend the Service Transportation Act, it's clear that those resources are going to be uh, much scarce and much less certain. So to address that, to get out of, in front of that, uh, we're working with our treasurer, Ted Wheeler, and his counterparts in Washington and California to develop a West Coast infrastructure exchange that's going to seek to support projects of regional significance through attracting institutional capital. So the idea is that, that we can get this right uh, we can become less dependent on the vagaries of funding from the United States Congress and actually uh, begin to attract uh, outside capital and private investment who see the potential and the potential of return on investment in this, in this growing sector. There's a very exciting model called Partnership BC uh, that's done, I think, $10 million of projects using private resources to help finance public infrastructure projects, and that's what we're trying to develop here on, on the West Coast. By collaboration, I mean a couple of things. Uh, I think Jim alluded to this. Collaboration is going to be essential for our ongoing and very serious conversations we're having about Oregon's system of public finance. 
For the last uh, eight months, we've been meeting with business and labor leaders and other stakeholders to try to find common ground on how to reform our system of public finance to make it uh, more predictable, more stable, more rational, to better position Oregon for economic growth and development, and also to provide adequate, stable funding for important public services, particularly public education. It's real clear that if we want to be successful on the economic and jobs front, that we've got to better protect our economy and particularly better protect our educational system from the boom-bust economic cycles that have been uh, plaguing us for, uh, for years. By collaboration, I also mean continuing to do something that makes Oregon fairly unique uh, uh, today. Uh, in Oregon, I think we all know that job creation and economic development should not be partisan issues and they should not be uh, a, a political footballs. Uh, are there going to be differences between business and labor and Republicans and Democrats? I think it's fair to say uh, yes. Uh, but uh, creating jobs and moving the economy forward should not be one of them, uh, nor should it be to cast this as a false choice between sound environmental stewardship uh, and growing our job base. And what we've seen in Oregon, and one of the reasons I'm just really proud to be involved in public service at this point in time, is Republicans and Democrats stepping up over the last 18 months, putting their differences aside, uh, and, uh, and getting the job done. Uh, we've seen public sector and private sector partnering in new and very innovative ways, and I think the reason is that we share a common vision for the state of Oregon uh, that transcends uh, the, sort of the partisan politics and the stakeholder politics, and we're acting together to try to advance that vision. And I think that's going to be particularly essential that we continue that after this election cycle. I don't think we'll be lucky enough to have a 30-30 House <laughs> again. Um, <clears throat> but we do have another biennial budget coming up. We've got a new legislative session. Uh, but I think we're starting from a much better place than even we were uh, 18 months ago. We had you know, high unemployment, you know, a deeply divided state, and I think we've seen some remarkable collaboration uh, down at the legislature and throughout the state over the last 18 months, and I think we need to continue to make uh, progress on that. So just to wrap up here, I think over the last 18 months, Oregonians have really stepped up to a, a pretty serious fiscal crisis that dem demonstrated their resiliency and their ingenuity and their entrepreneurial spirit. As I said, our unemployment rate is near the lowest. We've had it in, in three years. Uh, we've been named one of the top 10 states in the nation in which to do business. We've uh, balanced our budget. We've got our credit rating up from AA to AA+. Plus, uh, and uh, we've invested in better learning outcomes for kids. We're seeking to invest in better health outcomes for, for all of us. So all in all, I think we're well down the road to creating an environment uh, in which uh, the 21st century companies can grow and thrive uh, and, and expand. Uh, we should be very, very proud of what we've done in Oregon over the last 18 months, but it's not nearly enough, and we need to commit ourselves to do much better uh, over the next 18 months. Uh, I've often remarked that somewhere in America, a state needs to be able to demonstrate that we can meet our toughest challenges without losing our sense of community and without losing our commitment to one another. I think that is exactly what we're doing here in the state of Oregon, and I think we're emerging stronger and more united than we were two years ago. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Happy to try to answer any questions or take them and maybe not answer them, depending on what they are. <laughs> yes, sir. Does this include investing in educational labs, innovation labs that are attached to, to high schools or, or even community colleges where students are involved in creating solutions and developing that thought process for solving problems that gives them the skills to attract those innovation companies that we're looking for? Because right now we don't have a whole lot of labs to do those kinds of innovative thinking. Um, so that's a very good point, and I think you'll see uh, um, in the budget that we've got uh, this, this new 10-year budgeting process has, uh, has purchasing teams, essentially groups of, of lay citizens. We have, well, the education purchasing team is the one that would be dealing with that, and essentially they're prioritizing where we can spend resources to get the biggest bang for a buck, that is to move us towards 40-40-20. We know there's a number of leverage points, obviously, 
getting rid of the achievement gap on the front end is a huge leverage point. Reading at level in the third grade is a powerful predictor of whether you're going to graduate from high school. Gaining college credits in high school is a powerful predictor that you'll go and complete college, plus it reduces the cost and time you have to spend in college. And uh, in beefing up our STEM programs in our high schools, I think it's gonna, you'll see that as one of the key recommendations, and that encompasses, obviously, the infrastructure uh, and, uh, and tools that are necessary to actually uh, provide uh, those skills uh, for, for, uh, for our workforce. Hold on, One of our continual concerns while we see, you know, all of these things happening, we continue to see our high schools lose vocational training over and over again. And as somebody that employs people that need to work with their hands, you know, we just don't see those vocational programs coming, you know, coming or any funding coming for them. So, um, first of all, there's, I don't have any magic pot of cash here that I can address the salt. But we are, we are working on some other ways to try to get additional resources in the educational system um, in, the, in this coming year. Uh, it, it, but if you look at the 40, 40, 20 goals, the middle 40, uh, the people who are not necessarily going to get a baccalaureate degree but need a couple years of post-secondary education or training really do need better career pathways out of high school. And you, you, I think you touched on the, on the point uh, 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 vocational training, uh, automotive technology, a whole host of things. And we've got a growing sh uh, shortage in uh, our industrial workforce for welders, metal workers. Uh, as these people age out, if you talk to Terry Arneo down at Oregon Ironworks or Frank Foti at Industrial, I mean, they're really having a problem with this. So one of the things we're trying to do is do a better job partnering <clears throat> with some of our existing uh, apprenticeship programs with the high schools to actually see if we can figure out ways to collaborate uh, to uh, get additional um, opportunities for those kinds of exposures and pathways into, into the high schools. Uh, obviously, we need additional resources in that area, and hopefully we can get some in this session, but I think there are some, uh, some other ways we can begin to reintegrate that, uh, uh, th those services into our, into our high schools. Governor, um, would you please uh, tell us the progress on the Oregon Growth Fund um, for the public-private financing partnerships? Well, I think you're probably going to have to talk to Ted Wheeler on that. Uh, I I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm could not give you an up-to-date uh, 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 summary of that. Um, obviously, it's something that we've been working on trying to, as part of the larger effort to uh, improve access to capital, the Invest Oregon Act that we passed last session uh, was sort of the foundation uh, for that. Uh, but I'll have to uh, uh, admit not being uh, up-to-date on where that is right now. Thank you for being here, Governor. Lori Stakeman, Gresham City Council. Uh, as you know that our city is facing a shortfall for our public safety. And I'm wondering, a lot of my constituents are asking me, what tools do we have? And it's our property tax reform, uh, which is a major issue that is causing a lot of problems in our city. So I'd like to know how your administration can help our city. So this is a problem not just in Gresham, it's even more acute in South West Oregon, where those folks have depended for years on the receipts from the ONC lands, and we had, I mean, we will have at least one county uh, go uh, essentially bankrupt uh, within the next year, and there's several others in line, including Lane County. People don't think of Lane County as a rural county, but it's, it's facing the same, the same issue. Um, so there's some short-term and long-term issues. I think the long-term issue is to address what really were the, the compression that was brought about by, by Measure 50. We've got well over half our cities and a lot of our counties already in that where their growth is exceeding their ability to actually, uh, actually finance that. And, and at some point, that becomes a serious barrier to economic development. I think it's important to recognize this isn't just about local government financing. This is actually having the stability of public services that any responsible business actually wants to rely on. There was a powerful picture in the Grants Best Courier of these prisoners being released from the county jail. I don't know if you saw it, but you should Google it. They're just like running out of this jail towards the street. Uh, that's not uh, probably a very good economic development tool. Uh, <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce probably didn't like that picture very much. So uh, in the, there's, a, there's, a, there's some statutory things that can be done, and I talked to the LOC um, uh, just actually last week. Uh, none of them are easy. Uh, you know, the whole idea of, of uh, re reassessment at sale, 
Uh, there's some things, there's some statutory components, and, and uh, I have encouraged the, uh, particularly the Association of Oregon Counties, but also the League of Oregon Cities, to develop a legislative package and begin talking with their legislators, because ultimately I can't do this by executive order. It needs to go through the legislature. So I think it's very, very important that you educate your legislators about the relationship between uh, um, municipal finance uh, and the ability to, to attract and retain businesses. So hopefully we'll have, we'll have a legislative package. Uh, secondly, and I don't know if this, this is also, none of these answers are, are very politically palatable, but we have huge overlap and duplication around the state in our public safety service. You know, we have a county, we have, we have state police, we have county, we have cities in, in, in Southern Oregon, they have a variety of different jails, all of them have administrative services. So, I mean, the idea of thinking about consolidation and collaboration, which we did successfully up in the mid-Columbia River uh, area, um, uh, about 10 years ago is something that, that is worth putting on the table and asking, you know, there's turf involved, and, uh, but I think it's worth asking ourselves in this time of fiscal shortage, is there a way we could consolidate and create a more rational delivery system that uh, doesn't duplicate the administrative uh, costs? And um, uh, I'll be going back to the legislature again trying to find a stable funding for, uh, uh, source for the Oregon State Police. We have fewer police now than we did in, in the 1980s, and in many rural parts of the state, the state police is the primary first responder. So a uh, huge issue. We're hoping also, and finally, that our Public Safety Commission that's being uh, chaired by former Chief Justice uh, Munez will have some recommendations uh, on ways we can change our sentencing policies to uh, maintain public safety, but to get some cost savings that could be reinvested in, uh, in uh, law enforcement at the local level. Uh, Governor, you had a quite a successful legislative session last time with health care and education. What are your priorities for the upcoming session? What's on your short list? Um, so the, the 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 backdrop is to have a good another good session. I think that uh, <laughs> I think it's really important. Not I, this. I'm very serious about this. Regardless of who is in control, I think the the, the Senate's going to be with one or two votes, no matter which way. That in the House, probably the same. I think it's important for all of us to, to talk to our friends on both sides of the aisle and tell them that, you know, um, it's really important to, to duplicate that collaborative approach. You know, if we get gridlocked down like we've, we've done in the past, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to move our state forward. So we, you know, there's probably a third of the legislators who were new last session, and for them, they've never known anything but a functional legislative process. <laughs> if, if, if we can do that... If we can do that two or three more times, that's going to be the new normal. So I, I just I want to, that's, that's important. We need to help. We need to help on the outside ensuring that. So I have to, if there are two or three, the, first of all, we want to prove up these coordinated care organizations, which I think could be a, a, a potential game changer. Uh, the agreement we made with the federal government in order to get the, the resources, it was to have the inflation rate at the end of the second year at 3.5%. That saves about $11 billion over 10 years. Then we want to list that care model on the exchange and make it more broadly available. So if you were to put uh, school teachers and state employees in that kind of a care model, high, co high value, low cost care model, and it was growing at three and a half percent, that saves five or ten billion dollars over f five billion dollars over ten years. That's uh, that's a lot of money. That's two billion dollars. You know, it's 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 it, that's that could be the game changer in terms of getting more resources back in. If the private sector were to align their purchasing with the state and said, no, we want that kind of care model as well, and if you just think for a minute, if you could lower the cost of health care in your business to 3.5% a year, that would be an incredible economic development tool. So the health care is, is uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but that's one that's there. It doesn't require a tax increase. It requires making a system much more efficient and being more uh, demanding on outcomes. We want to uh, continue our efforts in, in the educational area. We have to deal with the, sort of the whole question of governance, the, the thorny issue of uh, local governing boards for places like Eugene, for example, um, is going to come up. But I think uh, this will be the first year that we're going to actually try to use our investment budget. And so that'll be brand new and probably uh, a, a bit controversial. Uh, and then hopefully we're going to make some progress on the whole issue of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of public finance. The, the only other issue I'm, I'm working on that could have ramifications uh, is uh, this, o this ONC issue. We, we're, we're doing an all-hands-on-deck effort between now and the middle of December to see if we can develop an Oregon 
consensus that we can take back to Congress and hopefully create a more sort of more rational, balanced way to manage our federal uh, public lands, which does have implications for certainly Clackamas County, uh, which is, a, is, an, is an ONC county. So thank you very much. So I don't know how I'm going to follow that up, Jim. We'll figure that out next year, and I'm sure with the creative group that we have to work on these type of things that we'll figure something really great. Maybe I'll, be, I'll call you and you'll have some ideas. How about that? So in our second half of our program, we actually are going to talk about some of the things that the governor mentioned in terms of workforce readiness and some of those challenges. And we have some excellent examples of public-private partnerships that are happening with some of our educational institutions and our industrial employers here in the area. So we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then I encourage encourage you uh, to hear from our, our panel and also from Graham Slater and Tom Russell from Adventist Health um, in our second half. So thank you so much.